but it was the preceding and subsequent events from revolution in Ireland to transportation to Van Diemen's land which had a major impact on Ireland and other nations. From dramatic escapes from Australia to heroic escapades throughout America, this is the story of three remarkable men over three decades on three continents. In the 1840s, Daniel O'Connell, or the Liberator as he was known, was leading a vast movement for the repeal of the Act of Union, so that there would once again be an Irish Parliament sitting in College Green in Dublin. This in itself would not mean total independence from England, but would give greater internal control. Repeal was the desire which O'Connell had for the sundering of the, the, the Union, the Union between England and Ireland. The young Irelanders were really the young intellectuals of the day, and in 1842, guided by Thomas Davis, Charles Gavin Duffy and John Blake Dillon, they established a newspaper known as The Nation. This newspaper quickly gained a reputation as an all-embracing voice for national identity and culture. The first editorial said, indeed, there are only two classes in Ireland. There's not Protestant and Catholic, but there are those who suffer from her national divisions and those who profit by them. The idea of the Young Islanders was to give the Irish people a past. They didn't see much of a present for them as it were, or much of a future, but they thought if they had a past, it would establish a kind of a, a background to kind of the, an identity, which could, would give them confidence in themselves and would prove to them in a sense that they were as equally as significant as the Scots, the Welsh or the English and in this sense to give them kind of a, a, an impetus to establish their own government. In the 1840s, the country was torn to shreds by famine. Over a million people perished from hunger and disease, with a million more emigrating in what became the worst period of Irish history. It was as if the country's heart and soul had been ripped from its very core and flung into the eternal black hole of damnation. Those unfortunate enough to remain behind either slowly starved and shuffled closer to the threshold of madness or else prospered from their neighbour's misfortune. As a result, tensions developed between young and old Ireland, with the supporters of O'Connell often being in the majority. There were many squabbles and fights between these two groups for allegiance. The young islanders uh, split from old Ireland, uh, the repeal movement, uh, as a um, dispute as a result of a dispute over um, physical force at the height of the famine. And the split with O'Connell came finally on, on, on what was known as the peace resolutions, which really was engineered by O'Connell to kind of uh, get the young Islanders to, to say that they would never, under any circumstances, uh, resort to physical violence. And the young Islanders found this very difficult to do because they pointed to various parts of Europe and various parts of the world where constitutional governments had been established through physical violence of some sort or other. The reluctant leader of this new radical movement came in the unlikely shape of the not-so-young aristocratic Protestant landlord, William Smith O'Brien. Unlike the tenants on his father's estate, William Smith O'Brien was born into a prosperous and privileged background, with an ancestry going back to Brian Boru and the kings of Thomond. For a bit of background, when his father inherited the Dremoland estates um, in the late 1770s, they were pretty heavily in debt and the story is that Sir Edward, William Smith O'Brien's father, wondering what on earth to do about the financial situation, um, approached this man, William Smith, after whom my great-great-grandfather was named. William Smith was a legal eagle who'd made a fortune of money out of bankruptcies and mortgages of absentee landlords' estates, basically. And uh, Sir Edward went to him and said, look, um, I've inherited this title and property and it's pretty much bankrupt, what am I going to do? And William Smith, who'd lots of money and no background, said to Sir Edward, who'd lots of background and no money, well, I've got uh, four daughters and my favourite is Charlotte. And so in next to no time, Sir Edward married Charlotte and she came with a fortune to the marriage. And the story then is that on their wedding day, old William Smith walked into the reception in Dremoland 
with a sheaf of bills in his hand and said to Sir Edward, here, Sir Edward, are the bills on your estate. And just for a moment, Sir Edward thought, oh my God, now he's got me as well, you know. And at that juncture, William Smith threw them into the fire and said, think no more about them. And basically, he bailed the O'Briens out of bankruptcy on that occasion. So his daughter it was who built the present Dremolan Castle. It was her money that changed what had been a relatively modest Georgian, you know, tower house or whatever into the vast place it is still today. He was, like many uh, children of his background and his brothers, he was packed off to boarding school in England at the age of six. He went to Harrow School at the age of nine, and then subsequently he was educated in Cambridge. Um, as a younger son of an aristocratic family, um, he had no particular prospects, and the usual options were either the army or the navy or the church, and he wasn't particularly much inclined to go for any of those. The other option was the law, and in the end, that's what he did. The people loved him. Even though he was an landlord, they seemed to have loved him. And every tradition I ever had of him, everybody spoke well of him. He was not particularly happy in the law. He wasn't particularly committed to it and doesn't seem to have done very much. Um, he, uh, his father, I think, was quite concerned as to you know, what was going to happen to his son and what he was going to do. And it was, I think, his father who suggested to him in the first instance that he should um, take the, the family seat of being MP for Ennis. And at that time, of course, that would have been an MP in Westminster because of the, the Act of Union. And it really seems that he discovered his metier in politics almost by chance. You know, he wasn't initially particularly motivated politically. But once he uh, went to Westminster, all of a sudden he kind of woke up to the fact of what politics were about, and particularly the Irish situation. Because of the class structure of the time in Ireland, and because of the role of the gentry, and because of O'Brien's kind of uh, antecedents, he was as it were, picked by the Young Islanders as a leader who would rival O'Connell. It was quite a shock to his family when after a couple of years he joined um, O'Connell's Catholic Association. His mother particularly was deeply upset by this because she was, a, she was herself a very complex and extraordinary woman. She was a, an absolute fundamentalist Protestant and yet at the same time, while she totally disapproved of William Smith going into politics in the first place, she was devastated by his joining the Catholic Association. And yet at the same time, because MPs weren't paid and he had no income, uh, he depended for his uh, livelihood on an allowance from his mother, because that's where the money was. She strongly disapproved of William Smith O'Brien's politics. She was worried on the one hand um, because she knew he wouldn't have an income. Um, she had seen her husband um, getting into debt because of his involvement with the government in Westminster. And um, she was very upset by his joining the Catholic Association and even more upset when he, in 1843, joined the Repeal Association and effectively became the leader of the Young Islanders. So this was kind of typical of her, that she kept disapproving of him, but she kept paying his bills. Two other key figures in the Young Ireland movement were Thomas Francis Marr, who was the son of the first Catholic mayor of Waterford, and the intellectual idealist John Blake Dillon, who had been instrumental in establishing the nation newspaper. Marr was born in 1823 to an affluent family of merchants in Waterford City. When he was less than four years old, his mother died, leaving the boy to grow up alone in what was once an elegant home overlooking the port where the family business had thrived. The young Thomas Francis Marr was packed off to a boarding school at the age of 10, first to the Jesuits at Longos and later to Stonyhurst in England, before eventually being called to the bar. But it was his early years in Waterford which had a profound effect on the motherless child. The young Marr developed an impatient curiosity and appetite for knowledge which would never be tamed. He wasn't a 
spectacular mind, perhaps. He was a, but he's a brilliant orator, and he was very influenced by uh, people like William Smith O'Brien. He dwelt on, as a young man, on what William Smith O'Brien said. He was uh, very influenced by William Smith O'Brien's grasp of statistics, of how much poverty there was in Ireland, and yet how much wealth it generated. He was very influenced by the story of the way market economics had closed down um, mills and the weaving industry in Ireland and centred it in northern England and so on. After the sudden death of Thomas Davison in 1845, John Mitchell accepted an invitation to become editor of the nation. Mitchell was the son of a Presbyterian minister from County Down who came to Dublin as a solicitor but soon turned to journalism. Well, John was somebody, I suppose, who it would be impossible to ignore. If you met him today, he would make an impact on you. Uh, he was a man of strong opinions, a uh, very volatile character. He would act uh, impetuously at times. Uh, he would uh, use his rhetorical and oratory skills to denigrate an opponent in a devastating sort of style. He was perhaps the most radical of all the young islanders. He was willing to countenance uh, the destruction of railroads. He scandalized O'Connell by writing an article in The Nation on how to pull up, how to destroy a railway, how to pull up rails, etc., uh, etc. Et At the end of the article, he says, of course, it will never come to the necessity of this, but I'm just telling you, you know, how to do it. It, w it was the events of the famine, which more than any other event uh, had a profound impact. On, on Mitchell's politics. Uh, he wrote in 1847 when travelling to Galway that he saw sights that would have driven a wise man mad, uh, that he saw things that he would never forget and would stay with him for the rest of his life. Although famines are natural, this famine in Ireland, he argued, was artificial and unnatural and it was a result that he took uh, of deliberate policies of the British government. Uh, to cause genocide uh, and he said although the almighty sent the potato blight it was the English that caused the famine uh, and that was that was a remark that um, coloured his whole interpretation of the famine it coloured his politics he was utterly therefore determined for the rest of his life to rid Ireland of, of British occupation and rule which he saw as deeply injurious to Ireland's interests um, and that radi ra radicalised him in his politics, uh, in his emotions, in his rhetoric, um, to inspire others to feel the same way he did uh, and to get them to act. I desire that the nation and the confederation should rather employ themselves in promulgating sound instruction upon military affairs. And especially upon the use of proper arms not with a view to any immediate insurrection, but in order to that stupid legal and constitutional shouting, voting and agitating should be changed into a deliberate study of the theory and practice of guerrilla warfare. And he had no time for those who didn't share that view, uh, even for fellow Irishmen who would not take up arms, who would not join him in rebellion. He says, well, let them go to the gallows, they may as well hang if they uh, voluntarily continue in this state. The final break between the Young Islanders and the repeal movement came when Marr gave his famous speech of the sword in the Rotunda in Dublin. Often considered by some old islanders to have killed O'Connell by his unfilial oratory, such as when he attacked O'Connell's peace proposals by, with his speech about abhor the sword, stigmatise the sword, if they do not give us a parliament to state our wrongs and grievances, we shall state them by arms and force. Yeah, yeah. The sword of the famine is less sparing than the bayonet of the soldier. Meanwhile, of course, around Europe, interesting things have been happening, and they particularly had their eye on France and, and, and Paris. Obviously, 1848 was a revolutionary year around Europe, but this was particularly relevant that the great crowds came out in the streets of Paris and in effect just by demonstrating overthrew the government. It happened virtually overnight. It was bloodless. It marked the end of a monarchical and conservative regime by King Louis Philippe with the people's poet Alphonse de Lamartine replacing Louis Philippe as part of the people's government. 
They were very influenced by the popular uprising in France in 1848, and they were very influenced by Carlyle's book, The French Revolution, which depicted the French Revolution as a spontaneous uprising involving no planning, no um, training with arms, simply a spontaneous reaction to tyranny. And they did believe that the Irish peasantry, even after three years of, um, of famine, had within them the seeds of such a spontaneous and unstoppable uprising. The response in Ireland was equally optimistic, with the nation proclaiming a bold prediction of what they hoped was to come, along with supportive addresses from the people of Ireland to the people of Paris. Even the flamboyant Marr exclaimed his sentiments with Vive la République, and for a time saw himself as the romantic Irish version of Lamartine. The New Islanders kind of very conscious of the, the Parisian kind of experience, and they decided to kind of send a deputation there. Thomas Francis Marr was one of them, and Smith O'Brien. Uh, they went to Paris to congratulate the provisional government. They thought, now we'll get the French on our side, we'll get French military support, we'll really scare the British government. One of the most concrete things that came back from that visit to Lamartine's Republic was um, that a committee of women approached Ma, a committee of French women. He always seemed to get on well with committees of women. I think he was a fairly personable and eloquent man. And he was given a tricolour, which was um, of green, orange, the Protestant tradition, the orange tradition, and white in the middle for peace. John Mitchell said, we'll yet live to see this uh, flag fly over an Irish Republic. Unfortunately, Mitchell never would, as his fire-spitting rhetoric was about to throw him head first into a blaze of a different kind. John Mitchell had this view of the peasantry that they would rise and they should rise in 1848. And he was arrested uh, uh, according to a very bad law called the Treason Felony Act. John Mitchell was arrested at his home at number eight Ontario Terrace and brought directly to Newgate Prison. Even from his cell, Mitchell was unrepentant when he wrote, the music my countrymen now love best to hear is the rattle of arms and the ring of the rifle. At his trial where he was charged with sedition, he was sentenced to 14 years transportation. Uh, Mitchell saw his sentence almost as a victory in one of those bursts of eloquence which could electrify men. Uh, he stood up in, his, in the courtroom and said, I have kept my word. I have shown what the law is made up of in Ireland. I have shown how Her Majesty's government sustain itself in Ireland by packed juries, by partisan judges, and by perjured sheriffs. And he hoped that in his sentence uh, that the inconsistencies, the illegitimacy of British rule in Ireland would be exposed. Uh, through his sentence. Well, he made reference to pack juries, to partisan judges, uh, that he said the whole justice system in Ireland was, was rigged, was uh, illegitimate, was uh, unjust, that you could not get justice, uh, objective, honest, uh, clear justice. And he argued that the sentence that he had uh, injured himself was, was evidence of that fact. With the possibility of a revolt looming on the streets of Dublin, Mitchell was rushed to the North Wall under heavy military guard and shipped off within hours of his conviction. And many people believe that it, the, the day he was shipped through, uh, transported through Dublin and put on his ship was the time for the uprising. Apparently Dublin was ready to rise. But the Young Islanders again, uh, advised against an uprising. If they'd given the word, there would have been an uprising. But they said there are too many troops in Dublin, uh, streets will be shelled by the Royal Navy, etc., etc. However, it was obvious that the government were going to pounce and transport all the leaders if they could, if they didn't actually hang them. And they left Dublin in early in July, 1848, just before the government suspended the Habeas Corpus Act, which would have enabled them to arrest them without charge, as if necessary. If you suspend the Habeas Corpus uh, Act, um, you, can, you have martial law, basically. The designated powers can arrest people on suspicion and lock them up for as long as they like. With Habeas Corpus suspended, 
and a warrant issued for the arrest of William Smith O'Brien. The young Irelanders were faced with no other option but to venture deep into the countryside in an attempt to drum up support. Throughout all of this, it was said that O'Brien appeared like a man caught in a dream. Perhaps he was. Or perhaps his grey dislocation merely reflected that of a country whose spirit was in shreds. But nevertheless, it was a dream which was soon to turn into a nightmare, as the talk now was of pikes and revolution. When habeas corpus was cancelled and warrants went out for their arrest, uh, they went to Tipperary, as we know, and they tried to spark earlier than the harvest of 1848 this spontaneous uprising. By the time they got, they got to Cashel, where uh, Thomas Francis Maher had a notion of declaring the Republic from the Rock of Cashel, which he was ultimately prevented from doing, it was clear that no one was going to come out, really, and that... Uh, they were on their own. They believed on their way that the people were only waiting for their word. They found that it was somewhat more subtle than that. They found that the, the people were indeed desperate, but um, it would not be a matter of merely saying a word, because after all, the people were not Calabrian peasants who owned their own firearms in most cases, and they were not in a good physical condition they had suffered three or four years of want. They had been led, been led to believe, and I think by uh, false propaganda, I believe in their own propaganda, that Kilkenny was very ready for uh, a warfare. And in some respects, I think they were comparing Kilkenny to, to Paris, the narrow streets and all of this. They foresaw that kind of activity going on there. But when they came to Kilkenny, there was very few people prepared to support them. Very few people had arms. Very few people were trained in any kind of armed activity. The reports to Dublin, to their organisation in Dublin, were very exaggerated. And when they got to the provinces, they found, for example, that Kilkenny, the town, didn't have 17,000 members, but it had 1,700, and very few of them had, had arms. And, uh, but up front, the picture looked very rosy decided to leave Kilkenny uh, and they decided to move on to uh, Carrick and Shore and O'Brien addressed the crowd and the people of the town didn't want revolution. On person or property. One of the things that he did was to forbid any of the people who joined in the rising from looting and pillaging the property along their way. must all go home now and return tomorrow morning he asked them to go away and get three days supplies and come back and exhorted them uh, that they must respect property. Return with provisions. There isn't enough food around here for one day, let alone four. People are starving. We heard the church bell. We thought there was food being given out. They're trying to survive on a daily allowance of one pound of Indian meal. I think Mr O'Brien is going weak in the head. Again, if, you, if you're going to have a revolution, you can't respect property. And so they drifted up to this remarkable part of the country, um, uh, the, the commons at, uh, at Ballangarry, which had a certain reputation because it was a mining area for a certain radicalism. And really, it was the final meeting of the Young Islanders, the remnants of the repeal. It was the final kind of significant meeting, really, in history. The leaders decided the best thing to do would be dispatch as many of them as they can um, among themselves, each to his own area, with the purpose of keeping the resistance alive until the harvest was in and food would be available for the people who were. And the locals were given the particular job of preventing the arrest of Smith O'Brien if the government tried to arrest them, as they were certain to do. They never really said they were going to have a rising as such, but they said, we want your protection. If the police come or the military come to arrest Smith O'Brien, will you protect us? And it seems the colliers promised to do so. I think myself it was the collier population, the, the people who worked in the coal mines, and the smaller tenant farmers, and really the people of no property in many respects, 
who were basically involved in the rising. On Saturday, the 29th of July, 1848, Sub-Inspector Trant, on horseback, led his marching men towards the commons in Ballangarry, County Tipperary, with the intention of arresting William Smith O'Brien. Confronted by colliers on the outskirts of the village and feeling that they were about to be slaughtered, Sub-Inspector Trant decided to make a run for it. The rebels immediately gave chase, cutting across dikes and ditches, with scythes and sickles slicing through the air. Running for their lives, the police made their way up a steep hill towards a two-storey house, which actually belonged to the widow McCormick. With the rebels hot on their heels, the police burst into the house. What actually happened there was a very minor skirmish, but it involved considerable courage, particularly when you remember that William Smith O'Brien walked unarmed up to the house and tried to plead with the Irish constabulary both to release the widow McCormack's children who were in the house and themselves to come and join the cause. You have the extraordinary spectacle of William Smith O'Brien uh, reaching in through a window of the widow McCormack's house, shaking hands with the police within, almost apologising for... Um, besieging him, them almost apologising for seeking to arrest and detain him. Realising there was a price on O'Brien's head, one of the police tried to shoot him, but O'Brien managed to take refuge. Meanwhile, Sub-Inspector Tramp was taking refuge of a different kind under the widow McCormack's bed. Learning that her children were being held hostage, the widow McCormack rushed back to the house while some of the rebels tried to smoke the police out. It was a gesture more than anything else, a tragic gesture and an ill-fated one, and in the end, it achieved very little. Mitchell records in Jail Journal uh, des describing the uprising as a poor, extemporised abortion of an uprising in, in Ballingarry, at this cursed Ballingarry. So he had no time for this uprising. He was uh, appalled at, really, the, the amateur effort of the uprising and the fact that it didn't take place on the streets of Dublin where there was at least a chance of getting a mass insurrection. I suppose it was about the world's least successful revolution. They were then transferred to Kilmainham Jail in Dublin, where they stayed for the best part of nine months. And I have a photograph here, which is apparently one of the very first photographs ever taken in Ireland. You've got William Smith O'Brien here and Maher and the governor of the prison. It was taken in Kilmainham Jail and it shows them along with the governor and a guard. And apparently it was so popular, they actually reposed the photograph with actors sitting in and apparently sold thousands and thousands of copies. Order. William Smith O'Brien, this court has found you guilty. And by the powers invested in me by Her Majesty the Queen, I now sentence you to debt. Oh. Yeah. Order. You shall be taken to a place of execution. William Smith O'Brien's mother wrote to him after he'd been sentenced to be hanged, drawn and quartered for high treason after the trial in Clonmel. The gist of a sort of ten-page letter full of God-fearing stuff is, well, there you are, I told you so, let that be a warning to you. Subsequently, William Smith O'Brien, along with the others, was given a recommendation of mercy and were transported to Tasmania, or Van Diemen's Land, as it was known at the time. During that three and a half month voyage, O'Brien wrote, I have sinned, O my country, but not against thee. Proud England, I have sinned, but my conscience is free. I have sinned against thy laws. I have sinned against thy might but no sin have I sinned against justice and right. Upon arrival in Van Diemen's land, he was offered a parole, which he refused to accept, and was then moved to a penal colony on Mariah Island. Smith O'Brien's time on Mariah Island would have been a tremendous shock to his system. Uh, if, if we consider that he was a man uh, raised with total freedom and uh, doors opened for him. He made the shots and uh, people followed. He's put onto Mariah Island, confined to a very small cottage area, restricted in movement outside the cottage, while he had someone to uh, 
make his bed or shine his shoes. The limit of his freedom would have been a total shock to his system. He was also unable to correspond with various people without censorship. Everything was being censored and he obviously took great umbrage at that uh, censorship. eventually was allowed certain freedoms insofar as he was allowed to walk around the island accompanied by an armed sentry. This was significant because an attempt was to be made to uh, free him. Smith O'Brien had wandered away from his sentry on his walk, had actually waded out into the water. There was a boat sent to pick him up. When he uh, got out into the water, all of a sudden the soldiers are there and he's taken back into custody. Smith O'Brien was then transferred from Mariah Island to Port Arthur, where he was to stay for the next two and a half months, before moving inland to Glen Derwent at New Norfolk. Altogether, he would have spent two and a half years here at Glen Derwin. William Smith O'Brien absolutely refused to drag his family out to the penal colonies, which he felt was not a good environment for his wife or his children. But he missed them very much, and he wrote to them whenever he could. Thomas Francis Marr accepted his parole upon arrival and was taken to Campbell Town in the heart of Van Diemen's land. He then moved four or five miles to Ross where he was given a little cottage and a small plot of land. But it wasn't long before the charismatic Marr met and married Catherine Bennett, daughter of Brian Bennett, who himself was an Irish convict. When Marr declares his, his love for this girl and the fact that he's married, marrying her. The letters of these guys uh, at the time were very critical and considered Ma to be impetuous and uh, she was below his status and um, uh, were critical of Catherine being a, a suitable partner for, for Ma. Now I find that to be absolutely at odds with the, the other principles they stood up for. But having said that, they eventually turned around after having met the girl and becoming more familiar with her to um, be really taken by her and um, happy for Ma and happy for the lass. Mitchell, on accepting his um, parole, was uh, granted the area of Bothwell. Uh, he eventually secured uh, a small farm and lived in what was known as Nant Cottage. As he felt that he was going to be here for at least 12 to 14 years, he discussed with his wife the need to bring the family out and set up home at Nant Cottage, which they did. He uh, had designs of being a, a farmer and he in fact raised some sheep and grew some crops and did these various things.
The three men were now settled and each given their own district on condition that they did not enter the other's district. William Smith O'Brien was at New Norfolk, John Mitchell was at Bothwell, and Thomas Francis Marr was at Ross. However, it wasn't long before Marr discovered a convenient meeting point, and that was at Tunbridge. The Tunbridge Bridge was sort of central to three of the districts. They met under the bridge. They arranged with the Tunbridge Hotel to have the silver service luncheon supplied with the tablecloths, etc., set out under the bridge. And there they'd enjoy a repast and have a little discussion about their problems. And no doubt to the great satisfaction of all the locals who would have been there gawking away at these strange Irish people. The trees stood proud and the birds sang loud. Yet strangely, I felt lonely. I pondered in vain, why all this pain in a place made for pleasures only? No doubt the uh, local constabulary would have known of all this, but uh, would have turned a blind eye to it, as quite a lot of the constables at the time were uh, emancipated convicts anyway. Catherine Ma was about four or five months pregnant when Ma's opportunity to escape came. During a period where supposedly uh, a patrol of police approached the area at Lake Sorrel, he emerged to confront them and said, here I am, take me or I'm off. He wasn't taken, so he was off. Thomas Francis Marr escaped from Van Diemen's land in 1852 and quickly made his way to New York where he became a citizen of high society before eventually being admitted to the bar in 1855. In the years that followed, he was to play a crucial role in elevating the profile of the Irish in America. Shortly after Mars' escape from Van Diemen's land, Catherine gave birth to a boy. But after only four months, the child died and was buried in this poignant little grave outside Richmond Church. William Smith O'Brien then wrote for Catherine, When snatched from ills that years await, a sinless infant dies. Let faith console thy breast by nature's sorrow riven, since now thy babe amongst the blessed has found a home in heaven. Catherine stayed with her parents until she had made a full recovery before sailing to Ireland to meet her father-in-law. In the meantime, a mysterious man by the name of P.J. Smith arrived in Van Diemen's land to assist William Smith O'Brien with his escape. Shrouded in a cloak of secrecy, they met a number of times at the Bush Hotel. Here they would hatch plans for escape. But O'Brien wasn't interested, and so John Mitchell, never one to pass up an opportunity, accepted P.J. Smith's assistance with escape. Mitchell resigned. Uh, his ticket of leave, as it was called, his word of honour to the authorities in Tasmania that he wouldn't escape. He walked into the magistrate's uh, office in Hobart and announced to the magistrate, I hereby withdraw my ticket of leave. Now, good day, sir. And he ran, <laughs> jumped out onto his horse after walking out the door and galloped off before he could be arrested. A uh, very dramatic sort of escape. There was then pursuing Mitchell around Tasmania for a few weeks until he actually did get out and he ended up with his family, with Jenny, uh, in America. And when he arrived in America after his extraordinary escape from Van Diemen's Land, he was uh, given a 31-gun salute from the heights of Brooklyn as president of the as yet unachieved Irish Republic. Mitchell started off in New York before moving south to Tennessee, where he became heavily influenced by Southern sentiments and propaganda. He writes that uh, there is nothing intrinsically wrong with slavery, that as for me, I would quite happily be in Alabama with a plantation well stocked with Negro slaves. Uh, and he seemed to be uncritically accept that view and actually defend it. Um, that, for example, a white educated um, man, a gentleman like himself, was superior to those other classes of convicts or slaves w w whom he came across. When Catherine Ma arrived in Waterford in Ireland, she's met by 20,000 
people and uh, with her father-in-law. She then went off to America to reunite with her husband, Thomas Francis Marr. She only stayed about four months in America, long enough to get pregnant again. Marr by this time was uh, quite a celebrity, socially very prominent in New York, engaged in speaking all around the country. I can imagine that Catherine would be overawed by the situation and it w would not have been her scene, I wouldn't have thought. She, accompanied by her father-in-law Thomas Marr, heads off back to Ireland, uh, where she uh, gave birth to a second, second child who was named Thomas Francis Marr II. Four weeks, six weeks after the birth of the child, she dies of typhoid fever and uh, is buried in uh, Faith League Cemetery just outside Waterford. William Smith O'Brien was finally pardoned in 1854. However, it was on the condition that he did not return to Ireland. He uh, alienated his land to a family trust, so it would not be taken from him as a result of the sentence of high treason. And he never regained control of his land. And he felt this very bitterly, very personally. His family, in his eyes, behaved badly. They were not interested in giving it back to him or giving him direction of it. And ultimately, he ended up in the Court of Chancery here in Dublin. Um, exacting a payment from his own son. So that was the sort of squalor and bitterness that developed uh, as a result of Ballingarry. William Smith O'Brien spent his last years in exile, mainly in Europe, and in fact, in the end, he died in Wales. His funeral is remembered in Newcastle West as being, you know, the largest that the county of Limerick had ever seen, and it was said that upwards of 20,000 people followed his coffin to the graveyard. So he was seen then very much as a national hero. And with only a year or two of his death, the statue that now stands in O'Connell Street was erected by public subscription. Thomas Francis Marr met his second wife, Elizabeth, Elizabeth Townsend, a very wealthy socialite lady in New York. There's talk that uh, she and Ma knew each other for only four or five days before they became agreed to become man and wife. There's also stories that the father was entirely against the marriage because of uh, Ma's background and his uh, volatile behaviour. Despite all that, they married. Uh, Ma um, got involved with the 69th Regiment in, uh, during our Civil War. At that period of time, uh, the, the French had fought in, South, in North Africa, and uh, the, the North Africans wore these, what they call, zouave uniforms. And it was very popular, very colorful. And the Americans saw that, and they brought it over here. And they had drill groups that would go around the country uh, uh, earning money, and also uh, uh, the zouave drill with the zouave uniforms. And they had a special drill with the weapons. It was all different and new, and people thought it was just the greatest thing going. Even the army wanted to adopt certain of the drill with the rifle <coughs> for our army. But it was the uniforms. The women loved them. Oh, they went out of their mind with those uniforms. So Ma said, if I have to raise a, uh, a company, I know how I can do it. I'm going to put them, get permission, can they dress in zoo uniforms? And of course, Ma, ended up slowly going through the ranks and given command of the Irish Brigade. He um, became a Civil War general, a great recruiter of Irish troops. At the start of the Civil War, Ma told his soldiers, first we'll knock off the rebels, it should only take a couple of months, and then we will invade Ireland. 
but in fact the civil war becomes all because it goes on for so long and it kills so many versions of the Irish Brigade, one Irish Brigade after another. There were periods during his career where he obviously uh, fell foul of the whiskey bottle and this uh, later was to uh, haunt him because uh, he gained this reputation of being a, a complete drunk. In those days, it was part of, just normal part of life. Everyone drank. Everyone. He was a very good soldier. He was an outstanding soldier. A bit flamboyant and a bit, uh, a bit reckless. He wouldn't move his command post in, in the thick of fire until the very last moment. On one occasion, he, his clothing was in tatters from bullets and his horse was shot under him but he stayed on his command post at the very last moment. Even after the war, one of the Confederate generals said that we admired the Irish Brigade. They were damn fine fighters and they had tremendous esprit de corps and those damn green flags, you know. We saw them coming and we knew we were in trouble. This is a replica of the original color. The original color is in Ireland. The Irish Brigade was led into battle on that occasion by Brigadier General Thomas F. Ma. Today, in recognition of what these gallant Irishmen and what millions of other Irish have done for my country and through the generosity of the Fighting 69th, I would like to present one of these flags to the people of Ireland. After the Civil War had ended, General Thomas Francis Marr was appointed acting governor of the lawless and often hostile territory of Montana. This hostility was further intensified by the arrival of white migrant settlers into what was then Native American Indian Territory. Consequently, the Masonic Lodge chapter in Virginia City set up a vigilante group. There were people that hated him and would have put a bullet in them. There's no doubt about it. It's a terrible politics. It was nasty, really nasty politics. He had very powerful enemies who could have arranged and murdered and there were many other people who hoped to get the job as governor of Montana. An instance uh, that illustrates that is a guy was um, grabbed by the vigilantes, put into prison. The supposed judge supporters of the uh, vigilantes uh, decided to hang him. Ma had him released to be recharged with manslaughter. The original sentencing judge said hang him, which they did. After they hung him, they uh, attached to the heel of the guy that was being hung a note to Acting Governor Ma, you'll be next if you don't stop interfering. Ma was then given permission to set up a militia. With six officers, he set off on a 200-mile journey from Virginia City to Fort Benton, where he was to collect a shipment of arms and ammunition. Marr was also accompanied by his wife Elizabeth, who only travelled as far as Helena with her husband. Little did Elizabeth know that this would be the last time she would ever see her husband again. Today in Helena, a majestic bronze statue to General Thomas Francis Marr proudly stands in front of the state capitol building. Facing Canada, and riding parallel to the Rockies, the towering Mar, with his sword triumphantly seized above his head, remains a significant ghost in Montana to this day. When they arrive in Fort Benton, there was a particular guy named Colonel Sanders, who was the prosecutor for the vigilantes. He's actually waiting in Fort Benton. Ma fills in the day wandering about with certain people, including a guy named Captain Doran. Captain Doran was the captain of the paddle steamer, the G.A. Thompson, which was tied up alongside. Ma went on board the G.A. Thompson. Doran later said, Ma made the comment that they're going to shoot me, that they're after me. During the course of the night, there's a supposedly a splash. The theory in the inquiry was that he came, because he was ill, came out onto the upper deck tripped on the coil of rope while trying to be, be ill over the side and tipped into the water. And a lot of times the railings wouldn't always be there where they should have been. 
and he was up on top, three stories or whatever it was, and uh, uh, undoubtedly he, he stepped out in the dark and ended in the water. I believe he was killed by Republican vigilantes to punish him for various political things he'd already done in Montana and to prevent him becoming Democrat senator for Montana. I don't think he was, personally. I think he just fell off in, in the darkness, in the stupor. <clears throat> I try not to think that somebody shot him. Despite the large rewards offered, Marr's body was never found and nobody ever solved the mystery of what happened to him. However, there is strong evidence to suggest that he was murdered. Some 40 years later, a guy named Diamond, on his deathbed, made the statement that he was part of a 10-man team promoted by the vigilantes to murder Marr. And he claimed that they shot him, took him ashore and buried him and he was paid $8,000. That story was supposedly recanted at a later date when he recovered from his supposed deathbed. Under what pressure, we don't know. The other thing that's of interest that he had actually resigned from his post as acting governor and was wanting to head back east. And I guess that's another example of, he's been there, done that, let's get on with something else. After the American Civil War, Mitchell turns to Ireland in 1874, after it must have been something like 26 years absence. And he was invited by um, Fenian movement in Tipperary to come back and stand for election, uh, which he did in 1875. And even when he ar arrived in Queenstown after sailing over from America, he was told that he had been uh, elected to Parliament but had been declared Ill eligible because he was a felon, a former felon. And continuing his campaign against uh, what he saw as British injustice, he wanted to make a mockery of the whole election process. Uh, he wanted to stand again and again and again and keep getting elected uh, to show the, uh, the whole thing as a farce. But at that stage he was, had become fatally ill and he spent his last days in his old boyhood home in Drama Lane in Newry, uh, where he died in 1875. Because of their contribution both to this old world and to the new world, uh, they deserve to be uh, commemorated, not least for their visions and not least for their contradictions. I mean, we, it's easy to send up um, their contradictions without sending up one's own. What do we want? If, we're, if, we want to, if we want perfect visionaries, we've joined the wrong species. We have to make do with imperfect ones. And they were imperfect, but in a way, glorious men. They had the right instincts.